Welcome to Public Safety Talk Radio, the podcast for all of our heroes in public safety, including law enforcement professionals, firefighters, EMTs, corrections officers, healthcare workers, and more. The show is produced by the POCUA and is founded upon its soundness initiative. This episode is sponsored by the Finest Service Organization, a provider of line of duty death loan protection through many of our POCUA institutions. Hi, I'm Ken Bader, your host for Public Safety Talk Radio, and as always, I am psyched to be here today. We have another great guest. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is Dr. Laura Petler. Uh, She is a forensic criminologist and private death investigator, which will be interesting not only from a public safety standpoint, uh, but also the work that I do for Podcast Magazine in covering true crime. Maybe we'll just talk about true crime today. Who knows? But as I mentioned, she's a forensic criminologist from North Carolina and South Carolina. She's a licensed private investigator. And most importantly, which we want to get into, she's an inventor. She's the inventor of victim-centered death death investigation methodology, and the inventor of the murder room methodology, as well as an author of crime scene staging dynamics. You know, I could go on and on. We got a long resume here, but let's get Dr. Laura onto the show. Doc, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here today. It's great to have you. I'm glad we got some of the Zoom issues out of yes. the way. <laughs> we can actually Always talk Zoom to issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was talking to somebody earlier today. We were talking about how there's just Zoom fatigue. But uh, <laughs> regardless of yes. that, we'll still have an awesome conversation. I was really looking forward to talking to you, especially Thank since you. you're the first forensic criminologist as as I can recall that we've had on public safety talk radio so uh, yeah first and foremost how does one aspire to that line of work what what is your typical day um if there is such a thing if for an expert in that profession you know were you growing up you know in in your room think, thinking you know I want to be a forensic criminologist tell us more about that <laughs> well you know it, I I didn't think I wanted to be a forensic criminologist I didn't even know what the word forensic was or that it even existed um I thought I wanted to be a doctor a medical doctor uh, even a veterinarian. But when I got into college, I went on a track of psychology first and really thought I was going to go into work in the prison and rehabilitate homicide offenders. I quickly discovered that that was not going to be where I was going to take my <laughs> career and decided to catch them instead. Yeah. And so, um, I started out in psychology and I did that because I felt like that was the foundation of understanding behavior, why people do things and studying normal behavior and then moving into studying abnormal behavior. And then from abnormal behavior, studying criminal behavior, which are really actually two totally different things. So forensic criminology is a combination. It's kind of a tribrid kind of career. And for me, as a forensic criminologist who specializes in homicide investigation, it means that I am like part forensic scientist in the hard sciences where I analyze physical evidence. And then I'm also part like forensic psychologist where I, I do behavioral analysis. And then I'm also like part forensic sociologist where I understand the environment and society and cultural aspects of the personality, cognition, emotionality, and behavior of both offenders and victims and how those two things interact that create the crime scene. And then how we use all of that in totality to build a mosaic of a crime so that everybody can understand it not only quantitatively from the aspects of the physical evidence, but also putting it in context with all of the behavioral evidence and the sociological evidence. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. For me, a typical day, I'm working case after case. Sometimes I'm out in the field, um, actually conducting interviews with my guys out doing surveillance, um, looking for suspects kind kind of all over the board, you know, when it comes to actual live cases. And then we also do case reviews here at Laura Petler and Associates. So sometimes I'm just sitting at my computer 
reviewing tons and tons and tons of paper. So it, it just depends. Wow, yeah, that you said in a nutshell, but that's a pretty damn big nutshell, Doc. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're right, Ken. It is. No, no wonder you had to become a doctor to be able to do all this. <laughs> I got out of school when I was 36 years old, and um, I like school quite a bit. You know, I do. I I enjoy school. I enjoy I enjoy learning. I love learning from people. Everybody I meet, you know, I learn something from. But it was kind of a master plan. I had really just like milestones to achieve throughout the journey. And it all started for me when I was about 11. And there was a little girl named Sherry Mahan, who actually I have a picture of her sitting right here beside my desk. But she was abducted from the county above where I grew up. And her case deeply affected me when I was very young. And there was this blue van with this downhill skier painted on the side it, it, in the, at the time it was considered unique. And they started looking for this blue van that had been following the school bus that day. And so then once I heard about the case, I started looking for the blue van and I quite frankly, I've never stopped. I'm always yeah. thinking about that van I, and I I'm sure it's long gone. I know, but I never really stop looking for it. Like, just if I see a van that reminds me of it, that's when it crosses my mind. Um, and then when I was about 17, maybe um, another a girl, I have her picture here next to Sherry's, but her name is Jennifer Diamond. And she and I went to high school together. She was a year older than I was and she graduated and was going to the community college. And her boyfriend shot and killed her at a gas station on the way to school one day. And those two cases just really... Um, even though I wasn't close to Jennifer Diamond, she and I weren't good friends or anything like that. She yeah. was just a girl I still went to high school with and Sherry Mahan, Somebody I never knew. knew. Yeah. yeah. I did know her, you know, in general as an acquaintance, but it, those cases definitely deeply affected me. I remembered them and carried them with me. So I specialize in domestic violence, homicide and staged specifically staged domestic violence, homicides, um, which carry into serial homicides because we have some people who get away with murder multiple times before they are ever, ever caught. So, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of it in a really kind of a very large. Nutshell. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely not a pistachio. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, if a coconut is actually a nut, we'd probably be more yeah. in that range. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Taking but, a long time to get to where I am here, you know, educationally, I guess it was a long road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're glad you took that road. In. Thank you. It's it's interesting, as I alluded to earlier, uh, and some of the folks in our audience know that I cover true crime for Podcast Magazine, mm. and and there's it, it, and I've had the pleasure to talk to some of the hosts for those podcasts that are yeah. obviously not of the level you are in terms of law enforcement and education and so forth, but many of them had one of those unfortunate experiences yes. at some point in their childhood and, and some of those folks you know and, and fortunately most police officers actually appreciate what they do in keeping these cases alive uh yes. but some of these folks you to know, a degree to a degree yes. to a degree but some of these if it's done if it's done properly correct it's done if it's done properly but you know nothing is nothing is worse for the prosecutability prosecutability of a case than a bunch of people sitting around bashing what everybody yes. did um, at the crime scene or didn't do at the crime scene. I mean, those are the same people that the that the victim's family need to be able to take the stand and be believable to a jury of twelve people. Mm -hmm. So if for years you're sitting around bashing everybody and everything that they did. How do you expect then it to go to trial and for a group of 12 people to find those people incredibly credible when all they've been hearing about them for the past however many years a cold case is cold is how horrible all of their work is, how, how you know, uneducated they are, how 
unqualified they are. So many things, nothing is worse than a case. And, you know, we don't advocate for discussing those kind of things publicly. If people make mistakes, of course, that we're all human. Um, but unless you have been a detective in the field, um, unless you are a, a DA's investigator like I was, a deputy coroner like I was, unless you understand the fluid nature of what is going on out there and all of the moving parts that are being balanced, you have no idea what it's like. You have to work homicide on the ground to understand what it is like. And um, I certainly advocate for law enforcement education so that we all continue to grow and learn. But I've been in this 20 years and very rarely in my worldwide travels have I ever seen someone maliciously, deliberately try to make a death case go cold. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. No, I, I agree. It doesn't happen. That. Now a word from our sponsor, the Police Officers Credit Union Association. Coming this October 2021 is the Public Safety Business Summit in Savannah, Georgia, a program specifically created for organizations that serve first responders. What you will experience is a high level of networking and collaboration among like-minded leaders who are in the business of serving first responders. What you won't get are a series of boring lectures with no interactivity, ridiculous golf outings that are only appealing to a few attendees, or a couple of retreaded subjects that you can hear at any credit union league event that are just thrown into the curriculum. We offer an engaging agenda where attendees even help to determine the content during the actual conference based on their unique needs. If you run a business, a credit union, or a nonprofit that specifically serves first responders, then the Public Safety Business Summit is for you. For more information, go to www.policecreditunions.com or call 331-300-9889. We hope to see you in Savannah this fall. Getting back to the, the nutshell, there's, there's a lot in that shell. There's, there's actual science, there's psychology, there's sociology. Is, is there a part of that that is, for lack of a better way of putting it, your favorite? The part that you really dig in and say, this is the part where I love diving down the rabbit hole. Um, you know, for me, it's not a rabbit hole. And, um, it's, it's a calculated, our system determines our out outcome methodology. So the whole, my whole point of doing what I do the way I do it is to avoid the metaphorical rabbit hole. But what I, what I started out loving the most was behavior. And then in the middle of my journey, I fell in love with blood stains, like head over heels, <laughs> head over heels for like, blood stains. Like, 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 like every girl does, right? I, yes. <laughs> and I just, you know, I could not get enough of analyzing blood stains and actually did a lot of work just in blood for years and years. Um, probably. I got my master's degree in 2003 and I probably did just blood only for many years after that in research and practice. And then added in, in the same span of my master's program. And then afterward, I also added shooting reconstruction to that. So I was working in that space before I went back for my PhD and focused on homicide studies and methodology and um, domestic violence and those kinds of things. And so I really was very much in love with blood, still am pretty much in love with blood. I love the physics of it. I love the fact that it's not emotional. I love the fact that it, you know, just sits there and waits for someone to discover it so it can tell its story. Um, someone that speaks its language and understands it really, really well and can interpret it clearly in proximity, in relationship and in totality to all the other evidence that is actually present there in a scene or at a crime. So um, 
then, you know, I got back into behavior and sociology more in my PhD work. And so then it just all merged together. Mm -hmm. And then the methodologies that I've developed prevent that proverbial rabbit hole from happening because we approach every single case with the same methodology that has built in fail safes that, so that we don't get off track. And because in crime scene staging, as you can imagine, I mean, their whole point is to throw off the investigation, right. is to misdirect the investigation. So the point of these methods is to, you know, they can take their rabbit hole and, you know, say, take it somewhere else. It's not going to work here. <laughs> not going to work here. We don't do rabbit holes here. <laughs> we don't do rabbit holes. Yeah. It, no. it, it, it amazes me, you know, watching and listening to as much true crime as, <laughs> as I do, how anybody yeah. can get away with anything with forensics, with, with cell phone pings, with cameras everywhere. It's like, how you, you must, you know, you, you, no. I think you got a plan for like 18 years before you can get away <laughs> with anything. <laughs> you know what? But here, here's the truth. And here, here's the truth of it. And this is, is, you know, coming from a former DA's investigator like myself, you know, and, and not only just the DA's investigator, that was actually the position I was hired in statute under the statute, but I co-founded and directed North Carolina's very first crime scene reconstruction and behavioral analysis program. I was also the head of the cold case task force in our district. I also ran an international forensic science internship program and co-directed the Richmond Community College International Forensics Institute, all of which were housed under Michael Parker, the elected DA's administration, who is, he is now retire, retired um, and is an expert here in prosecution, obviously, for LPA. So, you know, we still work together. We've been working together for 16, 17 years now, but um, now we work together in the private sector. Um, when... I was there, I learned a lot about prosecution and how and what it takes to get a case actually into the courtroom. I would solve one of these cold cases because solvability, Ken, and clearance are totally different when yeah. it comes to cold cases. LPA maintains about a 98% solve rate using our methodologies. But the clearance is 100% dependent on the law enforcement agency of which the case is under its jurisdiction pursuant to if that agency decides to make an arrest, if their DA's office feels that there's enough to prosecute, you can have enough for an arrest. Like we say here, you can arrest a ham sandwich. That doesn't mean you can prosecute a ham sandwich. Depends on how good it is, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's just that simple. So literally, you, you, can, you can arrest a ham sandwich, but that does not mean you're taking that ham sandwich to trial. And so when you think about it, you know, they have to have a, a, a sworn affidavit for probable cause, you know, to, mm -hmm. to swear out an arrest warrant or to arrest, warrant, arrest somebody on a murder charge or a manslaughter charge. Then you have to go through all of the probable cause hearings or you go to grand jury and it has to come back with a true bill. If there's no true bill, there's no indictment, the thing goes away. There's no prosecution. There's not enough probable cause to believe that a crime may have occurred and that it is worthy of trial. And that's what that's for. So, you know, then if you make it through the, um, the probable cause hearings or you make it through grand jury and you do get an indictment, then there are all the pretrial motions. And the defense in that situation oftentimes is, is moving to dismiss every single solitary time. They're moving to suppress evidence every single solitary time. And so if you make it through all of that and you actually get to the trial part, then the state has to present a trial and a case in chief that proves the charges beyond a reasonable doubt mm -hmm. and get that far without a mistrial. So then there's all these other rules and bars that you have to meet and jump over and hoops to jump through during the actual murder trial process to avoid this mistrial. Then after the case in chief is done and the defense is put on their case, then it has to get through jury instruction and actually get to a jury. And then when it gets to a jury, the jury has to then deliberate where there is still no mistrial and they cannot be deadlocked 
right? Where one person is a different opinion than the rest of them. And they have to come back with a unanimous verdict. Uh -huh. So I don't care about video. I don't care about DNA. I don't care about fingerprints or anything else. You can have one of those or all of those in a death case that is charged as a murder case. That does not mean that it will go through the entire process and make it into the hands of a jury the first time or any time. And there are a lot of legal reasons why that happens. And that is what I learned in the DA's office as the investigator watching all of these DAs do their jobs as lawyers. And then we, you know, we'd go to this hearing, then we'd go to the next hearing. We would do this, we would do that. We would file this, they would file that. It was back and forth and all of this for a long time, sometimes years. Mm -hmm. So what the general public thinks and what is reality for us in the field, whether we, uh, you know, as a DA's investigator, whether as a coroner, um, as a forensic criminologist who works with law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, medical examiners, detectives, all kinds of different investigators and private attorneys, trust me, there, there are so many things. It is not what the general true crime community or the podcast community thinks. Well, why can't they just do this? Why can't they just do that? Um, there are lots of reasons why just one thing will not move it into the courtroom. It has to be a totality of things that are moving together. And that is very, very difficult to do. However, it is not kept in perspective very often. Um, it's just not something that is, um, it's just not something that, that people understand unless you've actually done it. I don't blame anybody for not understanding it. It's just like, how are you going to know that if you've never been through it over and over and over again? I've worked hundreds of murder cases. I, I get it after all of that, you know, but how are you supposed to ever, how do you really understand what the process is or what you have to do if you've never actually done it? That would be like me trying to actually say, well, you know what? I know how to fly a plane. I've never flown a plane. Well, what, well, just, can't you just pull up on this, this, that thing <laughs> with has the handles and like press the gas pedal or something, or like move the wings around or something, you know, can't you just do that? No, you just can't do that. You know, that's why there's a whole process. So like people claiming to understand a lot of things, sometimes they actually don't understand because there's a lot of legal reasons why a DA can't move something forward legally that nobody understands except the DA's office. That's what I learned there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm understanding a lot over here. And one of the things I'm understanding is that despite my little line of questioning, it might be easier to just ask you, what don't you do? <laughs> I don't cook. Oh. I do not cook. Uh, no interest in cooking. I might like make some eggs like boil them so they're hard <laughs> boiled or something so so um, you like you know going to subway or grabbing a yogurt or, you you know, know. yeah i'm just like i eat lots of fruits and vegetables like things that are already grown and made you know like from the ground you know so not a big meat eater so no i don't cook um i i don't know i mean there's a lot of things i don't do you know i'm, I'm not a very not really tactical, you know, from that standpoint, we have an entire tactical division here that does that type of work. Um, there's lots of things I don't do. I, I, I stay in my lane, but I use cooking as a joke, you know, because, <laughs> you know, most people are like, how don't you cook? If there was ever a year I was going to cook, Ken, it would have been the year of yeah. quarantine. I'm still not cooking. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my, I don't think it's happening because I'm 46 years old. I'm not thinking I'm going to start cooking anytime soon. Yeah, but microwave brown rice works out really well. It's, You're right. It's ready no, in like I, 90 seconds. I made 90 it seconds. It's perfect. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm a real simple, simple kind of eater for that reason. Yeah, exactly. Protein shakes, you know, just mm. like super easy food, hard boiled eggs. Something I usually grab and... I'm usually doing 10 other things at the same time. You know, I live on a horse farm, so nice. you know, there's always something to do outside. There's always yeah. an animal needing its mother to do something <laughs> for it. Like they're not self-sufficient at all. You know, like they always are like, mom, 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 you know? So my first <laughs> children, you know, my life revolves around them.
Yeah. Well, well, I don't, fortunately, going back to a comment you made a few minutes ago, I don't have any ham in my kitchen. I do have some hot dogs I'm about to make <laughs> uh, for, for lunch. I like hot dogs. And I hope you're not going to arrest any of my hot dogs because I'm getting hungry. But No, I'm uh, not a cop. I don't arrest anybody. Yeah. I don't arrest anybody. I just analyze all the information for those who do make the arrests. Well, you're not a cop, but you're an inventor. And I really want to dig into these methodologies. You have invented a victim-centered death investigation methodology oh, as, the murder well, room. Yep. as well as a murder room methodology. So tell mm -hmm. us more about that. Want to learn more from Dr. Laura Petler on her inventions and the murder room? Then join us next week for part two of Victim-Centered Methodology. Public Safety Talk Radio is produced by the POCUA. The POCUA is a consortium of financial institutions serving law enforcement as well as other first responders and public safety professionals. To learn more about our association and to find one of our credit unions or service providers near you, go to www.policecreditunions.com. And always remember, if you aren't working with one of our POCUA credit unions, you're just banking with an institution that just so happens to serve first responders. As a public safety professional, you and your family deserve better. Find a POCUA credit union today.